Welcome to Squatch D TV. Exploring the Bigfoot mystery each week with your hosts, veteran researcher, author, and TV personality, the Squatch Detective, Steve Culls, and from the Bigfoot Research Project of Kentucky, Chris Bennett. Sit back and buckle up as we bring you guests from around North America discussing the Bigfoot phenomena, but not without a few laughs, too. Here are your hosts, Steve and Chris. And good evening, cyberspace. <laughs> Welcome to Squatch DTV for today's date, December 3rd, 2023. I'm your host, your guide, the Squatch Detective, Steve Coles, along with my co-host right down there, Mr. Steve, Chris Bennett. Good to see you, man. Hope what, everything's uh, working out for you. Oh, it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we got our guest, Chris Point. We got Jeremiah Byron from the... Bigfoot Society podcast on tonight. Welcome. Thanks for having me, guys. Oh, it's gonna be a fun time tonight. Where oh, we, yeah. were, we were having a bunch of laughs on the pre-show. <sighs> Too much. What's fun? You guys got any snow up there yet, Steve? Nope. Rain. Well, we don't either. They've been getting some snow out west. I was watching uh, some channels on the on the tube earlier, and I think somewhere around in Kansas is like uh, they had a lot of snow the other day. Yeah, we got a little bit in Iowa. Just a little Iowa. bit. Ooh. Oh, yeah. It's coming. Right. Yeah. Winter's coming. Oh, yeah. <laughs> shh, shh. Okay, so let's do our usual Ooh. roll call in the chat. <clears throat> so everybody Ooh, yeah. that's in chat that wants to be acknowledged, get your hellos in now. Yeah. Come on, guys. Where are you at? There's a, there's a lot of people over there, though. Uh, Good uh, to see everybody. Is. The chat is hopping. <laughs> it <laughs> is hopping. A little bit. A little bit. We're getting there. Still a little early. Still early. All right. Here we go. Everybody's saying hi. So first in tonight was Pat Collins. Hello, Pat. That's right. Good to see you, man. Pat. Low Rider. Low Rider. Walter Kroll. B. Lynn. Uh, Jeremiah is here also. And all all members of the channel. And yeah. uh, uh, thanks guys. to everybody. John from uh, Sasquatch Wizard Adirondacks. Jonathan's hey, there. Arthur Watch in the house. Blake Burroughs. Scott D. Terry is in Scott, Scott how's D. it going, Earl. dude? Scott well, Scott's Earl. one of my guys. Yep. <laughs> he even said checking things out for Jeremiah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Grasshopper in the house, Tennessee Cherokee. Right. Welcome back, sir. Little Kilroy, <laughs> not here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And of course, our old friend and channel supporter back again, Brian and Chewy go hiking. Hey, Brian. Brian. Uncle Bones, too, in the house. Uncle and Bones. all of a sudden, everything just jumped. There wow. we are. Yeah. Uh, Eyes in the Woods in the house Sharon uh, Alex Petikoff's in the house Over at Petikoff Media Jay Fritz Alex Jay Pete H Another channel supporter In the house Okay I'm lost uh, now <laughs> Helton A.K. Fasterman uh, Fasterman, Fasterman Another yeah, another, well. another channel supporter uh, Jay Fritz I think we already said him But just in case Jen's oh, in the yeah. house Hi hey, Jen uh, Rabbit Homesteading is in and uh, I think kidding. we're caught up already. Wow. Welcome, everybody. What a crew. What a crew. And it's <laughs> uh, probably more people will sneak in as the night oh, yeah. goes on. Like, I'm sure at some point Mick will pop in. and Oh, yeah. So let me just if go not, back. you know, it's okay. We have a lot of lurkers, and that's fine. You don't have to say hi if you don't want to. But uh, That's we, right. We say hello to everybody anyway. So. Oh, get me a Snapple. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, sorry, sorry, how to do it, how to do it. Um, Brandon, oh, Brandon, Brandon. In the house. Sharon's in the house. Sharon, that's right. This is the island of misfit toys. So, <laughs> so, uh, Apparently, the office assistant is off the chair now, looking at me, <laughs> smiling at me like I'm going to produce something for him to eat. Oh, yes. Uh oh. He should have some chewy sticks or something laying around. Sure. Mm. He's just staring at me. Just staring at me. Oh, yeah. Well, all righty. So let's, let's get to it. Jeremiah, uh, tell us about your podcast, how you started it, when you started it. Oh, jeez. Tate's in the chat now. Hey, Tate, buddy. Uh -oh. Good to see you. <laughs> 
<laughs> There's trouble in the house. Uh, how did how did Bigfoot Society get started? So, well, uh, back in February 2019, um, I got I decided to start a podcast where I talk to people in the cryptozoology field. It was a little bit of a po- different podcast back then. Uh, I had been involved with my friend uh, Andrew Peterson, who was uh, filming a documentary for Small Town Monsters in central Iowa about Thunderbirds, and he needed someone to ask people off camera uh, questions to get their answers for the documentary. And so he sprung that on me at the last minute, and halfway through, I realized, hey, I really, I love this. And um, I listened to a lot of paranormal podcasts, and I said, hey, why, why don't I start my own? Uh, to ask the questions that I wish people were asking. So did that for a while, uh, started to really get into uh, Bigfoot um, after I met people like Tate and, you know, being able to go out into the field a little bit. The podcast then started to transition into a completely different podcast over the last year where I started talking to more and more Bigfoot witnesses. And it was just fascinating uh, being able to talk to them, especially the ones where, you know, there were more and more were at the end of the call after we recorded the interview, they'd be like, you know, thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to share what happened to me. I can actually go to sleep tonight. I haven't been able to talk to anyone for the last 20 years about this. And uh, that just really, you know, hit me uh, pretty hard. And I was like, you know, if I can help people at the same time where I'm talking about, you know, something that I love, which is, you know, uh, Bigfoot, uh, that's, that's pretty awesome. And that's pretty much what the channel has evolved into. It's, you know, creating a, um, a safe space where people can, uh, feel like they are, um, you know, not going to be made fun of, uh, for, for sharing what happened. And, uh, yeah. there's a lot of people where it's their first time, you know, uh, being talking about what they experienced. So that's pretty much, if you listen to Bigfoot Society now, you're going to hear, uh, uh, Bigfoot encounters uh, from people all over the board. So, right. Yep. I like that. I think it's important that these guys have a place they can go and talk, talk to mm-hmm. somebody because a lot of people, you know, may have seen something years ago, but they've never told a soul uh, for fear of ridicule. Uh, oh, you he, he saw Bigfoot. He's nuts. <laughs> but uh, absolutely. Amazing. Um. You know, there, there, there was. There's so many mediums that have evolved. I think over the last, you know, ten years or so. A lot of times, people used to put their Bigfoot encounters on Facebook, and that was mm. problematic sometimes, because even though you might have a traditionally legit sighting, you would have the people in there really grilling, um, you know, the witness, uh. I think to a point where it's uh, unnecessary. I mean, there's a way to ask a witness questions without making them sound like they're, you know, under the, the lamp in the dark room. Absolutely. Yeah. Or, or they get into one of these Bigfoot groups where uh, it's not even, you know, people that really know what's going on and they just know enough to, to make fun of anyone who is, uh, you know, legitimately sharing something. And I, you know, I'll just share an experience where, you know, in Iowa, there was a uh, situation in the 1970s where there were a ton of Bigfoot sightings, right? So there's there a gentleman and his buddy, they started the Iowa Bigfoot Information Center. And um, he they were getting all the reports from the uh, law enforcement officials in the late 70s and going all over the state and, um, you know, researching Bigfoot. So I was able to track down one of these gentlemen, the gentleman that was still alive, and... Um, I've been trying to talk to him forever to get his story down so I can get the history of the Iowa Bigfoot Information Center. And so he's like, well, I'm going to get a little bit more on the subject. And then he gets into one of these Bigfoot groups and they just start laying into him. They're like, what are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. It's blah. And he almost pulled out entirely. And I'm like, can you come on this? And he's like, I'm not going to go on the show, but he is going to come on and it would have to be like a members only thing, but it's just like, man, these, these internet, you know, groups, they can be so vicious and it's like, right. There's so many encounters we're never going to hear because 
people are just tearing people apart and having no, you know, respect for human decency. So. Well, it's, there's a certain amount of bravery behind a keyboard. I yeah, believe. Totally is. Yeah. Right. I mean, uh, that's why, you know, Twitter's a real tough place. Reddit's a real tough place uh, because they're even less administered than, say, Facebook. Reddit um, is tough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, a lot of times uh, on these on these online forums, people hide their identity behind a chat right. screen name, whatever. And so they uh, have a tendency to be a little bit meaner than they would be if they were talking to you face to face. Now, a lot of times, yeah, people would say something to me that to my face, they'd probably end up with a fat nose or a fat lip. Totally. <laughs> um, here's one, too, is, uh, you know, Pat Collins. Actually, I talked to him on telephone to kind of walk him off the ledge a bit because <laughs> he he texted me and he got blasted today on, on, on one of the, the Bigfoot Believers site. Mm hmm. Not necessarily now. I, I let, let's let's clarify this. This is not the fault of the Bigfoot Believers site, but a, a, a gentleman posted this video. Um, and then this gentleman is from Pennsylvania, I believe, and uh, it, it's actually one of the videos that um, I, I spoofed on one of my shorts. Mm -hmm. You know, of the the drone footage where it's directly over the Bigfoot. I think that was where. Oh yeah, I played McGillicuddy playing. Yeah. <laughs> I, um and uh uh you know so pat looked at it and says you know he, he says being a true student of yours says i don't think this is real well this guy came down on him like a hammer oh I, 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 you don't know what you're talking about you know yeah, yeah and you know and this is coming from another one of those self-proclaimed experts right yeah. um you know, because he may have had a sighting. And I've always said this too, is, is that, you know, I, I get really, um, concerned. Um, I, I got really, con I, I get really concerned when a witness starts touting that they're a knower. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, 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 yeah. I, because I've always said this, uh, I mean, I know I, I can see a squirrel doesn't mean I know everything there is to know about a squirrel. I can see a deer. I can see a car. I don't know everything there is to know about it. But some of these people that allegedly claim they've had sightings start calling, well, I'm a knower. I've had a sighting. What do you know? Well, uh, what do you really know? <laughs> you know, and that's, you know, unfortunately, that's one of the bad twists, they, you know, and, and you have to ask them, well, what do you know? Mm. And, and they'll tell you how little they know. Yeah, because you know, or they'll say, "Well, I know they exist." Well, that's the extent of your knowledge. Yeah, that's it. You know, seeing a Bigfoot. When I did, uh, I, I've learned some things based on some of the observations, but it does not make me a knower of anything except that they exist. It's such a weird buzzword that's going around right now, and it's like it's red flag city, dude. Right? <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, I don't know, man. Uh, well, I, I, yeah. You know, Bill Shatner, when he did his uh, uh, show on Bigfoot uh, a while back, it's not been that long ago, he said that, like, he, he considers there's three groups of people. There are people that think there, you know, might be something to it, but they don't really believe it, you know. Then there's people that maybe investigated it a little bit, and they maybe had some sort of an experience, not an actual visual encounter, but it's got their curiosity built up. He said, but then there's that third group, the ones that have actually seen something that's out there, you know, right. and although they, they, they can know that it, it exists, it's about all they know. But right. it seemed like to me, that's where the questions begin after you see this big hairy thing walking through the woods or whatever. Okay, well, uh, let's just, how can this be? <laughs> and, can I, this be? And, and I think that word actually got bent out of control from yeah. somebody that was trying to say, yeah. Oh, you're a believer. No, I'm a knower. I know they mm -hmm. exist. Yeah. And then from there, uh, you have the appropriation by certain parties that want to use that word in, you know, on, you know, that they know everything there is to know about a Sasquatch because they've seen one they, yeah, or they alleged to have seen one. It can be a twisted little bit into trying to mean something else. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he was pretty hot and heavy. <laughs> mm. I was like, dude, relax. It's 
happens to me all the time. You know, if you say something. Um, so let's get back to uh, Jeremiah. So that that is, uh, you know, very interesting. And, and that, you know, how how these Facebook groups would, would cut somebody down that's been doing the research. And uh, let alone, you know, and uh, Alex made a comment, too, as well, that he's seen numbers of witnesses and, and, and you know, people that have gotten discouraged because of the stuff on Facebook. Mm. And I would dare say that the next uh, and, and one of the not necessarily the more dangerous things uh, we've had plenty of witnesses on there, but that can go sideways sometimes, too, especially if a. Uh, witness is lying that can go sideways real quick but if the witness is telling the truth it, it can sometimes go sideways even on a live podcast where you have a live witness on so that well, you know because you know, you know the part of being an investigator though is you know you listen to their people's stories and then you try to find out more and right. uh you know always you gotta remain a little skeptical yeah but you can't just say well unless you can prove what you're saying is true then you're right. lying no it's, but it's not work that way. now, now Jeremiah, you do all your stuff. You do yours pre-recorded, correct? Uh, yes, for the most part. So every once in a while, I will do a uh, live call-in show because I'm just a glutton for punishment. <laughs> and uh, but the the interesting thing is that I have gotten some really interesting um, uh, call-ins uh, from that, and you know. Um, there's a lady that called in once from uh, she grew up just outside of Oklahoma City out in the country and had a, had a farm. And um, supposedly uh, they their uh, farmhouse was being uh, messed with with uh, Bigfoot when she was a child. And it was a quick chat, but it, it will probably lead to, to something else and allow me to go uh, dig a little bit deeper. And I just wanted to call out real quick to make sure that everyone knows what what you put out on your channel. I don't know if you put a post out about it, but your forensic uh, investigation seminar you did for members only yep. is fantastic, Steve. I haven't been able to tell you that yet, but uh, oh, if you. people haven't don't know what that what that is, uh, become a member and watch it. It's about an hour long, uh, and that walkthrough is going to help me immensely, immensely in my future. Um, you know, pretty much. Uh, asking uh, witnesses questions and knowing kind of what the psychological behind the scenes is that they could be experiencing and, you know, how people, why people might try to uh, lie to you to get on screen, stuff like that. So it's a uh, great job on that, Steve. For oh, thank sure. you. And uh, uh, upcoming, like I said, I'm going to do uh, a, a, a basically a behavioral breakdown oh, wow. of of what to what red flags there are in Bigfoot sightings. Um, you know, basically it, it, the psychology of behavior. Um, why somebody may cut and run, or is it you know? Because there's a lot of times people cut and run. Um, I'll give you a good example: the Mississippi Skunk Ape video. That everybody's saying, oh, this is the best Bigfoot footage over. We, you know, aside from, you know, realizing that the person that that video was shot for a TV show that we eventually discovered. Um, we, we understand that the behaviors, here's the guy videotaping it for, you know, a uh, two minute or two. And then he decides all of a sudden he's going to cut and run. And psychologically, it makes no sense for him to cut and run unless the creature turned around on him. And it didn't. So it was like, you know, let's make this as dramatic as possible and stuff. And that's why you can watch certain, like I can watch certain crime programs and watch a bad actor do something. And like that psychologically makes no sense at all. Why, why a criminal would be doing that at that point, you know, if, if they were going to do it, they were going to do it at this point and not reverse course. It's kind of almost like, um, when people start a behavior, it's a straight line and it should always be a straight line. Now it may peak, it may valley, but you don't have these big intersect right angle intersections or one eighties, which you get on hoaxes is you'll get these all of a sudden there. This is the kind of behavior exhibited all of a sudden pff, we're going to do this behavior. And it makes no sense in the, in the process, I should say. So that one's going to be coming up, I believe sometime, hopefully by the end of this month. But, but thank you for that. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, um, I am looking forward to that. 
that's one that's one of the things I find telling <laughs> about an, an encounter when you know I ask somebody, well, how, how did you feel when you first saw it? You know, and if they're like, oh, I just felt peace and love and understanding. No, love, no, understanding. No. Let me get the gun. No, you've seen something, right? Yeah, you've seen something that's not supposed to exist, and you're Oops. standing there feeling peaceful. You know, watch us get demonetized for me saying that. Oh no, no. no. Oh yikes! Yeah, we but, don't want uh, that. Yeah. I'm, uh, you know, I, I kind of look at those uh, right. reports as like, well, uh, wow, you must be really brave. Right. Yeah. See something that's not supposed to exist, probably twice your size or bigger, and you're just like, oh, I feel peaceful. Yeah. Frightened at all. But I'll tell you, they scare the hell out of me. <laughs> well, that, that's the whole thing is that, you know, you look at behavior, you start with, if you're cold, if you're scared, you're going to stick with, uh, you know, you're going to hang on to your, 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 you know, that the little uh-huh, the, that the thing. G word yeah, yeah. thing yeah. from the start. You're not going to be saying, okay, I'm going to take my camera and shoot it for five minutes. And then all of a sudden I'm going to, no, no, no. And right. that's, that's like, no, unless it gives you a reason. And if in said video, there is no reason big flag, right. it's just a huge flag. But, um, so yeah. Um, so let me ask you this. Uh, and, and of course, I know you try to vet them as best as possible, as do we, uh, you know, you know, and you've had a lot of, of, of folks on on, your, on the cast for a while. I mean, what, you know, what percentage do you think somebody was pulling your leg versus, I mean, have you ever done a podcast? We don't have to name names. But if you're not on a podcast where you go, I really think that person was pulling my leg. So there are maybe a few where you know, i can think of maybe two or three where it it was pretty evident uh on on while i was editing being like oh okay this this is a little bit uh wild more than i realized during the interview but the thing is is that you know even through those maybe kind of out of control ones there are still you know those can still bring up you know, someone will look up that podcast and they'll listen to that and be like, hey, you know, that was kind of weird. But that actually reminds me of of something that I experienced in that same area. So it can still lead to other things. Mm-hmm. You know, my my favorite ones, though, are when, when you get the people where it's just Joe Schmo and they don't they don't know the lingo. They're just a, um, a guy from. You know, for example, I talked to a gentleman from Prince of Wales Island in Southeast Alaska a few days ago. He's just a timber worker. Uh, And what I had done was uh, I had posted in, I'd gotten into a Prince of Wales Island Facebook group, just a random Facebook group. And I was like, hey, I'm, you know, looking into Bigfoot. Anyone had anything weird happen? And it was like a lady in the comments said, "Uh, I know this, let me get in touch with this. So pretty much she had this guy contact me who's just a random t- timber worker up there on the island um, that was uh, fishing, I believe he was fishing or, or hunting in the Karta River wilderness on the east side of the island. And uh, he looks across his stream and there's a creature there on the side of the stream um, looking down in the water, long arms, and just looked like he's getting ready to fish. Um, it didn't know the lingo and it, the story was very quick. It was like three, four minutes. So I had to really like, you know, mm-hmm. ask questions to get into it. And sure. it, I was like, you know, what's, what's the, the face look like? And he was throwing out really interesting things. Like, you know, the face looked kind of like a, a orangutan cause of like the, the cheekbones. And it was just like very interesting, but you know, I like the ones where it's, it's the guys that, you know, it's just a blue collar worker. Like I talked to a gentleman once on uh, TikTok, which is a really interesting area. A lot of people give it a lot of grief because it's like, oh, it's just people dancing. Well, it's got the most uh, reach, organic reach for algorithms. So at this point, you have people on there. Um, and there's a lot of hoaxers on TikTok, but yeah. people will hit you up in the DMs. And it's people that this is their first contact with Bigfoot stuff, right? So I had a gentleman reach out to me who was a, um, in the 1980s, he was a, uh, a firefighter in the Mount St. Helens area. And he would, and he sent me pictures of him in the 80s 
fighting the fire at St. Helens uh, in that area. It was amazing. He's like, you know, uh, we were in the red zone. He had a red zone car and card and we were fire trail digging crew working at Mosquito Meadows near St. Mount St. Helens. Uh, and he would tell me that about how every morning he would get out of his tent and he'd be sitting on a log drinking some coffee and he would just start to listen uh, to what he described as gibbon whoops across the valley. And I was like, oh my goodness. And I couldn't get him to come on for an interview for the life of me. He was like, nope, I don't really care, but figured you might want to, you know, you can, you can tell people, but I, I don't really want to get involved more than just telling you. So uh, those are the ones I love you. Uh, I love, you know, they're just very cool. Yeah. 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 And, and they should be. I mean, most of your Bigfoot sightings are fleeting. Yeah. So it, it's really mm-hmm. tough to make them into a, a long soliloquy, you know, as far as like to have a two hour show on a, you know, uh, 45 second sighting is tough to do. Yeah. Um, you can do it. We've Jeez. done it. You've done it. it but um, it, it, it does make it quite the challenge, but that's what makes it more realistic. It's when people start devolving into these long stories that tend to open up holes. And I mean, there's been, there has been, um, there's one in particular that occurred on the radio format that okay. when I, that years ago when I re-listened to it, and I want to say this is maybe 10 years ago, and we had this gentleman on, um, and he was telling us the story of the encounter, and we realized when I re-listened to it, there was a part I missed, or there was a part I got, but I didn't say nothing, because a lot of times, unless it's blaringly obvious, I will withhold my judgment until the show is over with because as a host a lot of times even though we try to be you know uh you know all for the truth if somebody is starting to pull our leg we may just let them speak their piece not confront them or make them because they're a guest in our house right we don't want to make them feel unwelcome but we may do a follow-up like the following week saying hey listen we had a guest on last week that hey you know things didn't quite sound right and here's why we think that And one of the, um, I I remember it, 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 it came down to him saying that after he had his sighting, he was on this expedition in, in, in the South, he was very warm. And after having a sighting, you know, he, uh, he took his canteen, poured it over the top of his head because he was sweating so profusely. Okay. Well, a while that a while later, maybe forty minutes later, the interrogator in me said, "Well, you know, I was I was you know earlier I was sipping from my 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 canteen. Oh, what, what'd you have in your canteen?" He said, "Oh, Gatorade." Mm. <laughs> and that goes. Well, didn't you just dump that on your head earlier to cool? That? You know, why would you oh, dump? So, yeah, it's like all of a sudden you're like, yeah. ah, something's not right here. And that was, that was the, 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 and you know, nobody in the party, the only one that had the experience was him. Nobody was experiencing any secondary type of experiences. Like, like when I had my experience, uh, there was, it was always surrounded by these secondary experiences, either directly thereafter or in the morning, Hey, we discovered this. Um, so, uh, and there, there generally is, you know, when you have a group, if there, it, it, you know, that, that becomes worrisome when there, there's only one person that has the experience and nobody else does um, without any, any, any corroboration. Um, it's always important so, to do a follow up when you go, when you see something one day, you go back the next. Right. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, a good point. That's Randy, did I ever point. chance that area from the Vermont episode? I have not oh. yet because the weather kind of got really uh, crappy fast. Um, so we will be, uh, hopefully getting out there once the weather, you know, and the funny thing is when it's gotten warmer, it's been raining. So that's the, that's the other issue we've been dealing with. Like, like, oh, it's, it, it, you know, like tonight it's going down to like a low of like 38 degrees, which isn't bad, but it's raining. And it was in the high forties today, raining. So it's like, um, 
Maybe he, right. Helen said maybe he was a football player. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, that came into my mind too. Well, could he have dumped Gatorade on his head to cool down? Maybe, but it sounds unlikely. I wouldn't do it. No, no. I'm too cheap to dump Gatorade out, man. I, no way. I'd just be hot. Save my Gatorade. This stuff's like two bucks a bottle. <laughs> You know, and it was just the fact that he was describing that right after a sighting. I got so flushed. I yeah. I took my canteen out and dumped it over my head. And then later on, you find he has Gatorade in his canteen. So it's like, yeah, something don't sound right. And those are the little, those are the little facts. It's like a certain podcast, a certain podcaster and his cousin were surrounded by Sasquatch. And they said, oh, it was because of the moonlight. But then when you look at the day, when you look at the date of their event, it turns out it was a new moon. So how could you see all these at Sasquatch under the moonlight when it was a new moon? So it, it's yeah. sort of stuff like that. Um, so out, out, out of all your, uh, you know, forays into talking to people, what, what was your favorite story? Ah, uh, let's, Ooh, that's man. That's a great question. Um, there's, oh, there's been I mean, a lot have, have you had ones with habituation over a period of time? So, well, um, I mean, uh, is a, is a few, Put him on the spot, Steve. when, when, it, when I think of uh, habituation, you're, you're saying habituation, you're saying like the people want them there, right? No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. We're, we're, okay. So yeah, we're, we're things have are. Yeah. I don't yeah, even yeah. like that word habituation because sure. Sasquatch does not make its habitat or territory right. where a person lives. They never will. Um, Something I, where they, they've interacted gotcha. with them on a routine basis. Yeah. Or, or they're, they have been causing mayhem and, and, and antics on a property over a period of time. Um, um, yeah. My, my favorite one is um, it's one of the more listened one as well um a gentleman contacted me um uh, from a situation he had growing when he was growing up in a uh, wooded area near rainier oregon uh and this is uh this has also been on another podcast as well if it sounds familiar but uh just him and his uh family lived in this area where his father uh they were taking down timber like crazy and uh, pretty much for four years, they were messed with by a bunch of a, a Bigfoot. Um, and it got uh, extremely, um, it got extremely bad to the point where uh, this gentleman has told me that later on in life, um, uh, younger people grew up to be adults. They had... Um, had to have uh, counseling. Uh, they had mental health issues, etc. cetera. Um, it, it just, it's a great episode to listen to. Uh, the, the, and this has to do with, um, it was about the same time that the Trojan nuclear power plant was built near Rainier. Um, I've also talked to uh, Henry Franzoni um, about that uh, time frame. He was a, uh, he researched in that same area and uh, he was able to talk to the engineers that built, built Trojan Nuclear. And uh, the engineers themselves would say that around the build site of Tro Trojan Nuclear, they would actually see uh, pretty big footprints uh, around the size that you would say would be um, would be Sasquatch. Um, so that that's an interesting one. They tried to dispatch. I, I don't want to demonetize get you demonetized so i'll say they tried to dispatch with certain uh weapons and um uh they were not able to take them down uh it got to the point where this gentleman what he says the government came in and um pretty much bought the the property from them uh they didn't say why they wanted it but they bought it away from them um that's kind of a developing story uh hopefully it, i'll probably have to work on it for a few years but there's going to be more to that story well if you, um, need, you need any tips i can find out the truth of that real quick yeah yeah that's kind of interesting i'm, I'm really like, like I'll, I'll, I'll give you a great example uh years ago there was something that that 
it was uh, very high hopes and it failed called the Erickson project. Okay. And uh, one of the sites was the Kentucky, what they call the Kentucky ORV site, which is the Ohio river Valley site. And it was in Crittenden, Kentucky. In fact, I even know the road <coughs> and they bought allegedly uh, Erickson had bought the property from the owner, the owners, and um, very sordid tale. But they, they bought the, the property from the owners. And all I had to do was check out the property records. And there was the sale. Because all sales have to be recorded. Okay. Interesting. So, so if you go to the county that this is in, in the or the township, or especially the county, you can find the land tract, the okay. address. And yeah. then you can see who the owner of it is. And you can see a history of who owned it, when it was sold, et cetera, et cetera. That's a great idea, Steve. Yeah. And that would really, uh, I mean, we were able to confirm, yeah, Erickson did buy them from, you know, well, that, their name is out there now, the Johnsons that owned it. The Johnsons moved about seven or eight miles away on the other side of Crittenden. And then later try to get money from people claiming that the Bigfoot followed them to their new yeah. home. And uh, uh, somebody tried playing that game with Chris too. Yeah. And I think it was the same, the same, same Sedgway character in there that was trying to show for them without them acting like they're shilling. And uh, so a very, uh, very interesting uh, thing. That and that, the, the group and that, with the pancake videos and stuff. Yep. And, and that that, 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 that happened at back. the time some of that stuff was being released. The Erickson Project started to release stuff because they weren't going to air it. It was like a three-hour documentary. The All the networks looked at it and said, this is boring. And there wasn't really, you know, aside from a pancake eater video and some claims by, uh, and a lot of people didn't realize that, you know, uh, he was going to the Carter farm, the Janice Carter farm. That was oh, the sure. Yep. And everybody was going, uh, so, and then they, they did the whole Chewbacca face thing that I believe, yeah, uh, Matilda. You know, yeah, Matilda. And I think, um, I, I think, uh, uh, I think actually Randy Brisson, who has some questionable activity out there, um, just check out uh, the tall ones channel, Brent, uh, because, uh, I really think that, uh, that's the reason why it ended up failing, uh, was because when you start aligning yourselves uh without you know really due diligence of anything that's a problem uh that's a big 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 problem yeah. and uh especially when you're doing a a, a a story of that kind of magnitude where you're put, putting all this money into it and then you buy the property and then you realize hey what you know uh what's going on and the funny thing is is that uh, we did talk to a neighbor of that location, and this was the interesting thing. Um, that person did not know anything about the Bigfoot world at all. And she said, well, you know, for some reason, she was leaving bacon out for something. And uh, and one day she didn't leave the bacon out and something banged on the side of her house. And that was the extent of her story. But uh, when I was out there, you know, on that particular property, I, I didn't see nothing. I, I heard some owls. And that's when that shill turned around me and said, oh, you hear that? That's Bigfoot imitating an owl. Yes. Are you crazy? So, Steve, how, what do you feel about uh, the whole Bigfoot hitting the side of houses thing? It's possible. Okay. Um, I, I would not. Um, I, I got to tell you something weird. Uh, there were times at my old residence in Saratoga County, something would hit the side of my house right while I was sitting in the office. Like I'd be sitting just as I am now. And it's, I got almost the identical setup that I had at my old place here, except for I got a little more room and I got things spread out a little bit more and in a different configuration. But I would be sitting there and all every once in a while, something went boom, you know, and I'd be like, what the hell was that? Yeah. Mm. Um, and I go out there and look and nothing. 
you know, it wasn't like anything was near the house that it would hit the side of the house. So, okay. And it wasn't in winter time. So it's not expanding or contracting of anything. It was right. happening in the springtime or summertime or fall, but never like in the winter time. Yeah. But conversely, the winter time, I would hear tree knocking all the time, but they weren't really tree knocks. They were the popping of the trees right. expanding and contracting. Because the the hitting of the house thing, that'll come up every once in a while. Like I talked to a gentleman from uh, Clay County, Tennessee, and um, he's just like right outside of this. Um, the name escapes me of the park, but he's right outside of it. And um, he owns all, all this property. He says he's got something hitting the side of his house so hard, like stuff is coming off of the uh, the shelves. Uh, he's got Ooh. wood knocks around his property. Um there's one night at 2 a.m. Uh, there's a scream that's so loud, pretty much scared off the neighbors. The neighbors never came back. Um, it's just just really wild stuff. Like there's an old lady that that uh, lives next to him. Um, she has actually seen one of the creatures. Uh, she tried to take a sh uh, shot at it because it like came after her her dog and pretty much almost took her dog out. So. It's just I've I've always wondered about the whole hitting on the side of the house thing. So thanks for yeah, I, I it think could it's, be possible. Uh, yeah, I'll give you a great example. The uh, the the night after I had my juvenile sighting, mm -hmm. um, uh, the night of my juvenile sighting, something had left a log, a birch log, behind uh, the, uh, Jeff Thomas, who's been on our show, left a, a birch log behind his jeep, directly behind his jeep. And he was at his Jeep about 11 o'clock at night, gets his pillow and blanket, goes to bed, gets up the next morning after I had my sighting unbeknownst to him because I'm not up yet. He goes out to put his pillow and blanket back and here's this birch log right behind his Jeep that he would have tripped over, you know, had it been the middle of the night like the night before. Mm. So, you know, but the next day I said, you know, just on a hunch, maybe we should leave something out there whatever and we forgot because we were filming for nat geo and we got done filming with them we were tired and then the next night uh, and somewhere i have this audio i gotta i gotta pull it out but um we're uh we're all again the same night you know melissa goes to bed jeff goes to bed me and wayne go to bed and within 15 20 minutes later we hear this boom something slapped one of the hoods of our cars. I mean, you could hear wow. it just slap its hand. Now we never found any prints or anything like that on it, but you know, it was the only thing we could describe. We caught it on audio because we left an audio recorder going that night and you hear it. Boom. And you hear me go, what the hell was that? And you hear Wayne go, I heard it. And then you hear Jeff go, well, I'm up now. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and, and I mean, it woke us all up and we go out, we inspect the vehicles the next morning in the daylight. There's no dense divots or anything on the vehicles, but for it to make it a sound like it wasn't something passing by or nothing like that, because that would have been caught on the audio. But all you hear us go to bed and, you know, you hear quiet and then all of a sudden you're boom and man. And then you hear us going, what the hell was that? Um, made no sense. No sense whatsoever. Um, because I think had it been a small critter that kind of fell on the, on the vehicle, you would have had some kind of impact dent. Um, because I mean, I've had an acorn fall on the car and leave a divot in the hood of the car. Mm, sure. Um, so what that was, I, I have no idea. Was it a Bigfoot? Can't say for sure, but it's one of those things we can't explain. You know, and a lot of the people that, uh, well, I'm not going to say that the Strictly happens in Alabama, but a lot of the the stories that you hear from Alabama, uh, they comment about uh, something had slapped the side of their house. So it may be something to do with southern behavior of these creatures or something. I don't know. I think it's possible. It's never happened to me, but I, I think it's possible. Yeah, Chris, you know, I've only heard um, most of my reports. It, it is in the south where it's like slap on, on the side. There's one outlier where it was a um he's a gentleman who contacted me and he had owned a 50 acre remote property up in um, northern maine by the canadian border 
And um, he's like, yeah, we, we just had a, a trailer out on this property and uh, really, really old school. You know, he was like, yeah, one day we were out in, uh, he was washing dishes in the stream. Uh, he looked up, he saw this hairy creature run across in front of him. He's like, that's weird. He wasn't a Bigfoot researcher. He's just a guy who was like, he just wanted to be away from stuff. Right. Um, later on, they were inside their um, trailer. He said that the trailer got hit so hard that it actually got hit off the blocks. Mm. Um, something started leaving. First, it was uh, sticks in front of the entrance to the trailer. It escalated to one day. Uh, they went outside the trailer and there was a uh, bear head, a black bear head without the rest of the bear, um, mm. just the bear head hanging out there. Uh, it was that that point that he decided to uh, immediately like he left. the He was like sold the property, moved down to South Carolina. He's like and I was like, do you want can you talk about this? And he's like, no, I just want to give this to you and then never talk to you again. I was like, OK, because uh, he'd been haunting him. So. Uh, that's the one outlier, Chris. But yeah, most of them happen in the South. You know, my my question is, and I'll ask Chris, and uh, I'll ask both you, Jeremiah, and Chris, if something left a bear head in the middle of the trail, would you feel intimidated by that? Well, it was on the like, it was on the entranceway to their trailer. Okay, would you feel intimidated by that? I mean, I would have questions. Definitely. Yeah. See, I, I, w I, I would. wouldn't feel, I would not feel intimidated by that. Okay. Why not? Well, think about it. W what does a cat do? Brings dead animals to your doorstep a lot of times, right? Okay. The cats actually gift. Yeah. Hmm. That's their way of saying, yeah. hey, I brought this home for you. All right. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, so that's an interesting way to think about I it. When I look at it like, is it trying to scare me or I don't think it's trying to scare me. If it would scare me. It would start rocking the trailer when I'm in it. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Um, well, I, I would start throwing rocks at the trailer if I was trying, you know, and that's typical behavior. I mean, look at yeah. what happened up at the cabin in, in Canada there where it was throwing rocks at the cabin. Oh, sure. Yeah. Right. And the same thing allegedly with Fred Beck, uh, you know, throwing rocks at, at the yep. cabin. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, as far as the it being hit so hard, it pushed it off. It's 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 blocks a little bit. I, I wouldn't say that was a hit. That might have been a actual. Hey, is anybody in there? Let's get a reaction. Right. So you really, you know, you don't know because I, I've seen, I've I've made observations over the years that you know a rock come into camp the size of a baseball. I have it somewhere behind me, actually, on my my rack back there. Um come in the middle of the camp when I'm just sitting in the camp silently with another researcher yeah. and the mainstay of the team has moved out. And the whole idea is to see if it would come in and really quiet and let's just stay here quiet, sit and watch, let the, the mainstay group make all the noise going away. And within a, uh, you know, about five, 10 minutes of them being gone, here comes this rock into the camp, mm. you know, and what I think that is, it's to get a reaction necessarily to see if hey are you there is anybody there if i throw a rock it'll send them scurrying yeah so that is that is really wild uh, and it's amazing oh. how, how many people don't want to come on the show and i can understand it's, their reluctance yeah it, it I, I mean it's more than you you would think where which i that kind of in a way is like okay you know the person isn't in it for uh fame or fortune or to look cool in front of their buddies like it you know usually is a thing where they just have to like you know some sort of like confessional type thing i don't know but it's it's weird right but yep i mean like 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 our guy that we had on uh, uh about a month ago from vermont mm, that was a good know, episode he, we didn't want you know he didn't want his real name used because he, he doesn't want any notoriety he just wanted to tell a story and some of the things that's going on on his current property and, um, you know, it's very fascinating, very legit case. And, uh, sometimes that's, that's what you look for. And that's why I love going to the, the Whitehall Bigfoot festival because people will come up and start talking to me. Yeah. And now what I started doing, and if you ever go to shows, make up some slips 
Hey, if, if you've had an encounter, here, write your name down, email, phone number, brief when, when your encounter happened. You know, hear their story and I'll contact you later. And, you know, we can get you on the show or we can, you know, talk more about it. I had to learn that the hard way this year at the Van Meter Visitor Festival, which ironically happens the same day as Whitehall. Uh, this year, I had people coming up to my booth and this had never happened where uh, added, they were just like, oh, hey, uh, I wanted to tell you about how I saw Bigfoot back in the 70s or in the 80s up in Minburn or, hey, here's a track we cast. We want you to look at it. And I was like, oh, my goodness, where this never happened. And then I was like, oh, I have no way to get in touch with these people. So I had to like write down names on a notepad really quick. But yeah, that's a smart idea having the uh, the slips to give out. Yep. And I have the stack right here. Nice. And these are all just, you know, all little contact cards, you know, and, you know, there's that one. And, and so there's a bunch of them. And I have, I have one guy who actually was, uh, uh, and I, I can't wait to contact him. He actually had a sighting in the fifties. Whoa. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Gotta be old. Yeah. Yeah. He was date of yeah. encounter 1951. One. Oh, wow. So I can't wait to get a hold of him. And yeah, that was prior to the Bigfoot uh, name being coined. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. That was seven years before Jerry Crew. Cool. Shout out. Have you read this book yet, guys? You need to read this book if you haven't. Shout out to Dustin with the Abominable Snowman of uh, California. Uh, dude, it's like 500 pages of Bigfoot history from the 50s. All that stuff, Ooh. Jerry Crew. It's really good. So, yeah, see, I love so those out there. I love the sixties. The the you know anything sixties backwards. I love some of their. You're gonna love that book. I actually, it was kind of funny that uh, the things you find is uh, when I first uh, years ago when I first moved over to Saratoga County, I walked into this old bookstore, and they had an old copy of Ivan Sanderson's The Abominable Snowman. Oh wow! I was like, I'll take that. Thank you very much. Fifteen dollars. Mm. There you go. You know, and uh, you know because there uh, you see where, <coughs> uh, you know the <clears throat> I have to one of the things I noticed. I don't know if you've noticed with the, the Bigfoot mystery is that you know it gets retold mm. and retold, and sometimes it takes a different form. So that's why I like having some of these old articles. And such because that's the purest form you know mm -hmm. you know what uh, and you know there's been some some misinformation over the years and even henry franzoni great yeah. guy but he i, I remember the, the the benchmark show back in the 90s this is before finding bigfoot this is before monster quest this is before uh, you know any of the the other shows that have now propagated on on the discovery networks um, but, uh, the show was called mysterious encounters and it was on A and E. Okay. No, I'm sorry. Not mysterious encounters. Scratch that. It was ancient mysteries. Yes. It was on A and E and they had an episode on Bigfoot. It was, it was hosted by Leonard Nimoy very nicely too. Um, and uh, Henry was on there and had said that Ape Canyon was named after the Fred Beck incident. And it totally right. wasn't. Yeah. Uh, and then sometimes that's how misinformation gets handed down and we get oil, well, you know, and the reason why we try to correct that is not to shame or embarrass anybody, but that's so we don't sound to other people like a, a group of, you know, people that are making stuff up. Yeah. yeah and, and thankfully you have people like Mark Marcel that is yeah. taking the time to, uh, document the his the true history of the Ape Canyon incident, or you know, you have people like Dustin who took like five six years uh, to go through correspondence and articles to put down the history, so it it doesn't get lost because Bigfooting is a weird thing. Uh, our history could get lost in uh, one to two generations right. easily. It could be gone if unless it's written down uh, somewhere in print, right and uh, just uh, very kind of weird to think about how quickly, uh, you know, hopefully the next generation is into it as well. But, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, you look at my, my bookshelf behind me, I have books, uh, you know, some of the newer books 
Uh, and they really got to grab my attention a lot of times too. But I, I got Sykes book when it came out. I have Meldrum's book, of course. Mm. I, I've got, uh, you know, the Bill Munns when Roger met Patty book. I've got the Bluff Creek Project by uh, Robert Lederman book. But I also have books by Renee DeHinden and Don Hunter. Yep. John Green, uh, Grover Krantz, Ivan Sanderson. Uh, uh, even a book called The Strange, Ab uh, The Abominable Snowman. And it was written on a, uh, under a pseudonym of Eric Bauman. Okay. And Eric Bauman actually was a pseudonym for John Keel. Oh, that's cool. Well, yeah. wow. I did not know that until I looked it up. Oh, wow. Oh, this is actually, so I have one of those books. And, and a lot of these, like, like that book's <laughs> publication date is 68. Grasshopper in the chat. I don't read Bigfoot books. <laughs> hey, bud. <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, There's nothing wrong with that, Grant. That's right. That's right. Right. Uh, but if you you, want, if you, yeah. Go ahead, the, 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 the problem is, is we have so many new people involved in the, in the mystery, but they don't know the history of it. Right. right. And they make some critical, critical mistakes. Um, and, yeah. and they have some, you know, misconnotations like, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, and I didn't want to go back to last week's discussion, but, you know, you know, why wasn't all this high strangeness out there in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s even? Uh, it only really started to creep into the early 90s, all the high strangeness with uh, Bigfoots being able to jump portals and all this other stuff. Why, why all of a sudden the jump, you know, yeah. and why did it explode with the advent of Facebook? Hmm. Yeah. Right. You understand? It's not because it's a new phenomenon. Otherwise, there would have been books in the 50s, 60s, and 70s about it. Right. Even the 80s. I think the the one book uh, written by Kawani Lapsaritis, uh, the Psychic Sasquatch. Yep. yep. That was the first one really to come out with any kind of woo involved in it, and that was about Bigfoot mind speaking. And why, why is all of a sudden all the woo stuff, the majority, it seems to be the majority now, you know, uh, rather than, you know, and uh, that's, unfortunately, that's a product of uh, social media. Uh, it's not, oh, product, yeah. it's not a product of what really goes on because the vast majority of I people I've talked to, when they see a Bigfoot, it's normal, regular. Now, if there's other stuff going on around it occasionally, and that's very occasionally, I should say, yeah. it's not necessarily you can't connect it directly to the Sasquatch. It's like, well, that day I also saw some orbs or I saw this or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't connect with that. I mean, just because I may witness a crime doesn't mean I also won't see a person jaywalking, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think uh, you have a couple of different phenomena there that uh, are completely but, but separate. Likewise, putting them together. <clears throat> but likewise, um, you know, even here, if somebody has a woo story, they, uh, you know, they will get a respectful possibility. Maybe this is what it is. That's what it is using science. They won't necessarily get, you know, they're not going to get shunned or made fun of or anything like that. So this mm -hmm. is one of the areas we try to make a, safe space too and i'm sure you do as well oh yeah i mean in i talk to people all over the, all sides of the board i talk to people that you know have seen what they believe to be ape creatures i have uh you know i've talked to uh, uh rick relis shared a a, a story uh something he encountered in backbone state park in iowa uh this is up in the northeast part of the state where you know, they saw a uh, blue orb in front of them and um, they're like, oh, that's weird. There's a blue orb in front of us. And then they look behind them and there's a what they said was a Bigfoot there uh, with its hand outstretched uh, controlling the orb. Uh, so, you know, I, I I pretty much talk to people from from both sides of, of the board and, and it. It's such an interesting story because there's no like, you know, Ten Commandments of, of Bigfoot that that say, um, you know, what, what is true, what is not true. You know, personally, myself, I feel that, you know, we're looking at a uh, undiscovered, you know, grade ape type primate, you know, 
that's just my personal uh, belief, you know, hold to like the Olympic project and uh, love what they're doing out there with the nest site. But um, yeah, I, I do talk to people from all, all sides of, of the, uh, of the Valley, I, I guess you could say when it comes to woo versus uh, not woo. So, well, yeah, you have to, you have to yeah. navigate it um, somehow, you know, uh, what, where I do have an issue with, and this has happened to me at several conferences where somebody comes up to me with a photo album, you got to see all the pictures of Bigfoot I have. Mm, and they yeah. start showing me, you start showing me these pictures and I'm looking and they're saying, Oh, don't you see him next to the house? He's cloaked. And that's where I draw the line. I'm like, sorry. Um, you know, uh, there, you know, I, I can understand people thinking they may jump in or out of portable portals. Uh -huh. uh, I can understand people where they may have an encounter where there's a Bigfoot. And then shortly thereafter, there's a UFO. I can understand that. I can understand a, a Bigfoot disappearing in, some, in front of somebody's eyes because <clears throat> science does have a number of different explanations for that. Right. I can also explain it even by some of the paranormal aspects. You know, where you're not looking at a Bigfoot, you're looking at something else. Mm. What I, where I draw the line is when people are start saying, oh, you see the cloak ones. Well, how come you can see the cloak ones, but nobody else can? Yeah, yeah right. That, that there is an issue, and that's where I draw the line on that. Yeah, and, and you're crazy if you can't see it, but I right. can see it type. Right. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally get it. Right. Yeah, not good. And unfortunately, they'll put that picture up on, on social media. And they'll be people, oh my God, that's so great. Wow. Look yeah. At that. Look, at yeah. That. Look at that. And then, and then before you know it, you know, you have, uh, you know, you hear this voice from the beyond. Weird, weird, weird. <laughs> <laughs> they put the woo up on Facebook. They get reinforced. And now you, the woo blows up into lunacy. That's right. <laughs> the voice from beyond. Oh boy. Very um, pictured. Um, but, you know, even, I mean, but, you know, like I said, not really get back to that argument, but I'm sorry, this, you know, this was not so prevalent in the 90s. This wasn't so prevalent even in the early 2000s. It was not until Facebook blew up and every, you know, unfortunately, I have to say probably about 80% of those people are either saying things to make themselves feel important. Mm -hmm. or, you know, they're a little out there. Um, but, you know, when I talk to people like Jay Bachochin, who's had some, some mystical experiences, you know, mystical experiences around his Bigfoot sighting, when you talk to a person like Michael Merchant, you mm -hmm. tend to think, all right, they, they encountered something, but what, what was it exactly or part of parts of it? What was it? So that, you know, that's where I have to, you know, because, you know, the, the the penchant for those people to be bullshit artists are very low. So, uh, you know, you got to you got to look at it, that that aspect. But you get the, these fly by night. Oh, well, I had a big I sit there and I I cyclically project to Bigfoot every night. And he comes over. Right. Like, yeah. You know, and <clears throat> um, I think you've you've met Jay personally as well. I've met him in Iowa. And yes, he is is one of the nicest guys. Um, yep. yeah. And I would say, you know he's not a gentleman definitely that is is trying to pull the wool over your mm -hmm. eyes for, he's, he's a he's a good dude up there in wisconsin he, for sure he's, he's genuinely boondoggled by everything that's going on he's like i oh yeah he's called me up and says I, I you know he actually called me up when this stuff was going on on the phone because you know we talk to each other and he's like i i, I can't explain this i i just i i can't and it was you could you could hear the inner frustration of him Mm -hmm. But conversely, I think that's why some some people turn to the woo as an explanation. And as you can see it, the frustration of not being able to get the proper evidence for something. And this is prevalent in a lot of, amongst some higher IQ people, people that have necessarily science degrees, that they tend to turn to this explanation. And that's part of being anthropocentric is... Well, we're humans. We should be able to find this like that. 
And that just simply isn't the truth. And when you can't find it, then the only explanation you turn to is the fantastical. And I think that was Eric Bechard's dilemma. Very high cued guy, member of Mensa. Um, uh, uh, you know, Berkeley educated. Um, was a flesh and blood guy. And then when these things started happening, he couldn't explain or he couldn't explain, understand why we couldn't get a hold of a creature or capture one or get evidence. All of a sudden he turns, well, it's got to be this. It's got to be something supernatural. Otherwise, we would have found it. That's a cop out. Yeah. And thank goodness we have groups like NAWAC and uh, Olympic Project and the Bluff Creek uh, project and you know that are in it for the long haul and uh i i don't see you know those groups uh switching over um to to the woo side any any side anytime soon so although i guess you never know but i i don't see it happening <laughs> well yeah there's a lot of things that people can't explain like it, it just this i was watching it and it just disappeared right well you know they, they can do that i mean not not blink out but, supernaturally but, uh, yeah, right. three three steps and man this thing is gone i i always point out to that deer how long does it take a deer to cross a road right. and then once it gets into the wood line mm. you know if you're in a where forested area where to go sure you know but that's neither here nor there i mean our, our our talk is that doesn't mean these people should be shunned we should listen to their stories no no i'm i'm um, all about yeah i'm all about i can accept a a, an activity that is described as being superhuman uh, because these are not humans. Okay. I, they're, they're some sort of, there's something else. We don't, don't know for sure, uh-huh. but uh, they're, they have strength and abilities that are beyond the normal human range. So if something is able to run up. And I ran into this with a buddy of mine, John Gray. Uh, we were out investigating a, a story of a, a sighting that happened on green river where this thing went up this hillside uh, right out of the great, the river and uh, it disappeared, you know, and it, it created, it covered such and such distance in like 15 seconds. Well, we were out there huffing and puffing going up that hillside. And I mean, on your hands, because it was so steep, you're on all fours going up the hillside and we were huffing and puffing and it probably took us 10 or 15 minutes to cover the same ground that this thing covered and, 15 seconds mm. you know or less uh, i guess oh. i guess nikki was lurking out there in chat <laughs> no give me a snapple <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um what was that uh-oh oh there we go oh i just lost all my comments here oh no oh, no oh, oh. There we go. There well, we they're go. still up. They're still up. But uh, yeah, we had. Uh, Why is it doing that? A, a lot of reports will right. say something about it disappeared. Well, the, you know that's understandable. They can do that. I mean, uh, without any kind of magic. Yeah. Give me three steps, Mister. You never see me no more. Yeah. And you know that's another reason why I don't really go out during the summer here in Kentucky. I I, I look at and, the stuff. and hey, you know Walter Kroll made a great point. We watch magicians all the time and can't believe our own eyes. <laughs> oh, that is a great yeah, that's a great yeah. statement. If you think about it, you know there is all this illusion you see go on these magicians do, mm-hmm. but it's not really magic. They don't really disappear. They don't really levitate. They don't really, you know, you know, and like Chris Angel, some of his levitations were amazing, but it, it, it's, you know, it, it it's all has a logical explanation. You just got to know the secret. <laughs> um, right. Yeah, and yeah, you know, I I think, uh, but getting back to the original premise, um. Yeah, I mean, I don't like to shun anybody that tells a Bigfoot. Like I said, when I when I started the hashtag Stop the Wounacy, that was meant for those people that see the cloaking Sasquatches. You know, oh, you know, they're always seeing them. You know, I'm not talking about the one-off person that has this experience with the person that's constantly going out in the woods and seeing a, the Bigfoot cloak over here and taking pictures of woods with nothing in it. The people that go around and see glyphs and stick structures um 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, yeah. like, oh, look, the Bigfoot left me a glyph, and they have a bunch of sticks in a certain order. Sorry, that's not a glyph. A glyph is a stone etching. Right. It's, it's not even a glyph. But they, they've kind of just, you know, number one, that's not good science to say that's a glyph. Um, and number two, it, it's like, did you see a Sasquatch make it? No. The same with, with the gifting bowls and leaving fruits and then you come back, all the fruits gone. Well, no, duh. There's animals out there. <laughs> there's in the other animals. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Um, so that, that, that gets, you know, and we, we've seen videos of bears, you know, doing the high row back with the uh, clotheslines to get to a bird feeder or to yeah. uh, food. That's it. So anything is game, I suppose. I mean, that's why when you set your bait up high for a Sasquatch, you've got to put cameras on it to see what's getting at it. Yep. You know, Pat's got a good one here, Steve said, if Sasquatches can disappear, why don't they, <laughs> why don't they, when they cross roads, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> That would be well, the perfect time, you know, dis disappear, cross the road, then reappear. Well, you know, they don't want to get hit by a car. That's why they're born. You know? But yeah, I, I mean, uh, you know, and my question was, if they can, if they can do all that, why aren't, why aren't they ever seen in cities? I mean, why, why doesn't anybody well, ever seen a Bigfoot in New York City? Oh, in New York City. Okay, New York City. Yeah, that would be a new one. Yeah. yeah, I'm talking about metro metropolitan yeah. areas. Like you don't see one in downtown Albany, New York. You don't see one in uptown Manhattan. You don't see one in, you know, in Poughkeepsie. You don't see one, you know, in City Square in Red Hook, New York. You you don't see any of that. Well, you know, it, I think I did actually read an encounter some years ago about uh, some guy that claimed to see one in Central Park in New York. But, probably somebody uh, in a costume. Yeah. Or, that would be the safe bet. Could have been, um, yeah. Yeah, because if you go to that area, there's no forest. I mean, there's some forests right. it's miles away, but you're right. you're surrounded by city. You wouldn't be able to get, get in, there. get out, take a cab through the city. Right, right. Now, yeah, right. <laughs> now I can understand, like like Waterford, New York, back in the '80s, had a sighting on like Ninth Avenue, um, and uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, it's a village. It's not really a city. Um, and, and that's right on the, the outskirts of the city. So at nighttime, yeah, could it slink into a neighborhood real quietly without being discovered? Sure. Whitehall, the same thing. There was one scene on the outskirts of the of the village. But you know what? It's a couple hundred yards to the forest. Right, right. That makes sense to me. And then that forest is, yeah, you could go anywhere from there. So that makes sense to me. But when somebody says, oh, we see it in the middle of four inter you know, interstate highways, that have 2 million cars trash by it every week. It's pretty hard that nobody saw it leaving or coming in. Right. You know, without a big ado a, a about it. So even if it came in in the middle of the night, there's cars that are, you know, constantly going through these interstates every night. Oh, yeah. So. Um, I'm just checking out some of these comments, Steve. Oh, Patrick, I'm going to go, go down on. to the Big Cypress Reserve. Cool. Do a little be, snake hunting. Good. Be careful. Yeah. <laughs> because there's also gators oh. and anacondas and uh, yes. all, all kinds of other things that would like to kill you. Well, I, yeah, I learned my lesson about, uh, especially if you go around Florida, you know, uh, when I used to, I used to drive a truck down there for Amazon well, in the roundabout way. And uh, at a certain area where I on I seventy I seventy five, you get off on I ten. I would stop there about I don't know four or five miles away from the intersection where I on I ten, and I would Hello? pull off there, and that was a nice quiet place in the road, you know. And it's a little swampy. Hello, <laughs> Henry. Henry. Good to see you, sir, and welcome aboard. And uh, one night, uh, you know, as as I pulled off there, I heard a lot of splashing and stuff going on. It was alligator or as i call them a crocagator mm. so i got back in the truck and i never never stopped there again <laughs> crocagator i remember i, I actually i actually remember doing my cape canaveral tour my you know uh cape kennedy mm -hmm. tour and uh they stopped the tour bus on you know near one of the landing pads for the shuttles at the time 
And the and the bus driver's light gets on the PA and says, uh, "Please avoid the gully over to the left of the bu- uh, to the right of the bus. Mm. There is a t- fourteen foot gator in the bottom <laughs> of that gully." Oh <laughs> wow! So what's the first <clears throat> thing we all do? We all go look walk in and look at the gator. <laughs> wow! Wow! That's some <laughs> gator. Oh, oh yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, right, right. Tell us something not to do. And what do we all do? <laughs> we do it. Hey, don't, don't look behind you. Have you ever I had told you not to look behind you? Have you ever had gator before? Yes. I it's deli- kind of like chicken. It's delicious, yeah. though. It's kind of like chicken with a pork texture, kind of. Yeah. Yep. I had blackened gator down in Louisiana. Mm. Cajun spice blackened. Oh. So, yep, that's one of the few. I haven't had snake. I've had elk. I've had bear. I've had venison. Uh, I think that's it. I really haven't, like. I've got a bite of rattlesnake, but it's not, not really. I, I can't recall anything but just butter. I tasted butter because that's what they cooked it in and they dipped it in. But that I was have... real popular. In uh, New Mexico, they would have rattlesnake roundups every year. And I bet they still do. Somewhere around Alamogordo, I bet they still have a rattlesnake roundup, and that was, that was a big deal. Everybody would bring in rattlesnakes, and they would weigh them, and then <laughs> and then cook them up. But, uh... <laughs> a chipmunk is good, but you need a dozen like chicken wings. Wow. <laughs> pat. Um, Yuck. I mean, don't do that when I just have a drink. Spit it all over my monitor. Oh, porcupine. You see that? Yeah. What does that? I've heard somebody eat raccoon before too, but they say, Mm. you know, the raccoon, you really have to wrap and garlic it up because it tastes pretty rancid if you don't. I'm like, why even bother? Gross. I mean, if you didn't need to eat it, why bother eating it? Well, you know, I mean, me being from Kentucky, I've eaten a lot of things that people were probably like. My wife was shocked. Of course, you know, she's from Thailand when she came here. And I told her, you know, one of my favorite things is, is rabbit. She's like, you eat rabbits? I said, well, yeah. Y'all don't eat rabbits in Thailand? She said, no, no, we only eat rabbits or pets. So over there, you know, they, they have a rabbit in their, in their house or whatever. That's their pet. Over here, you know, hey, we... Put them on the you know, you know, the fire. <laughs> here, here's a very interesting thing, Jeremiah. And I don't know, well, not, you know, you do some life, but once you get on the topic of food with these guys, they go off the handle <laughs> <laughs> with witnesses. No, with, with the chat. Look oh, them, with the chat. Oh, oh, yeah. The, yeah. Handle. the chat is hopping now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The, yeah, they're getting into it now. I'm just glad the chat is being uh, nice because the last time I had a live, oh my goodness, I had 20 trolls in there at once and I was like trying to ban them all. It, it was just crazy. I had Abraham Lincoln and I had all these presidents that weren't alive. And then I had like famous Bigfoot researchers in there. I was like, these guys are not the real oh, guys. Yeah. You're out of here. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, this is a good <coughs> crew. Here's Mick. Hey. Hey, hey Mick. Oh, sorry. <laughs> B. B. Love. <laughs> yeah. Don't get big started talking about me, Love. Yeah, me too, Pat. <laughs> but uh, yeah. I've so been, uh, that's a good question. Instead of leaving an apple, why not leave a rotisserie chicken from Costco? Oh, that's a great idea. No, it's not. You know, I talked to a guy in um, around the Oak Ridge, Oregon area who his thing was he would uh, he would leave uh, like fruit pies for him, that makes Cob- sense. cobblers and stuff. And I, I mean, something was eating them. I, well, it's yeah. sweet and salty, sweet and salty. Right. Now, my only thing about leaving a rotisserie chicken may be a good idea. It's kind of like one of those things, but would it eat it because it's cooked and it's not sure what it is necessarily, but I'm not sure. I tried, I tried everything. <laughs> I don't think they trust you enough to take eat something that you leave. 
I mean, we, something we, we, we talked to Bruce Hallenbeck and Bruce Hallenbeck, who experimented with some stuff at mm-hmm. his grandmother's property when his grandmother was having all those sightings <coughs> during the 80s Kinderhook uh, creature flap. Right. And um, <coughs> he left a raw chicken up there that disappeared. He left fruits and stuff that disappeared. And he would took the bird house off the stand. So he would leave it up on a. Now that doesn't mean a raccoon didn't climb up there or something else didn't climb up there. Yeah. But they, he said he left a pizza in a box up there <laughs> and he found the pizza box off to the side of the yard. And uh, the box looks like it had been opened, but the pizza was still there. Whatever it was, wasn't sure what it was. So it didn't eat. Uh, oh, that's really weird. And that would, because a raccoon would go to town on a pizza. Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah. And a porcupine and a skunk and a, you know, you got to understand a lot, you know, porcupine, skunks, uh, uh, possums, they, they all scavenge. They don't care what they eat. Dogs, uh, even yote, coyotes and coy- uh, foxes, they'll scavenge too. I mean, just like a dog would. Cats, I'm not so sure. Mm. Bobcats, I'm not so sure if they would. Because cats in general are pretty freaking fussy. <laughs> yeah. I, I tried big in 2010, man. I tried everything, and then I, I was Al, Al, at, Alex said Bigfoot was watching his figure. Yeah, man. there you go. I, I was working with Steve, and he was giving me, you know, uh, feedback on what worked and what didn't. You know, I call Steve, talk to him for a little bit. Well, you know, I thought sure as the world, these things would be crazy for oranges because, you know, when I lived in in New Mexico, okay, I, I'd go out to the the Alamogordo primate facility, those chimpanzees, man, oh, they would do anything. They loved oranges. You give them a section of an orange, man, they were your best friend for life. Hmm. And yet when I leave these oranges in the woods, no, no, nothing touched them. They weren't interested in them. And then Steve brought it up. He said, well, you know, how would they know what an orange is? And uh, I started thinking, oh, you're right. And if the you oranges think about- grow here. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and think about a citrus food. If you think about a citrus food, um, what protects the fruit? Because the fruit essentially is its seeds. Yeah. What protects this fruit? It's rind, right? Mm-hmm. It's skin. Yeah. And, and does the, the skin of an orange taste good? No. Bitter. Not to me. Yeah. yeah extremely no. bitter. Same thing with uh, any of your citrus fruits. Their skins are extremely bitter mm-hmm. because that would protect it from animals such as <coughs> raccoons or right. other right. varmints from eating that because of the initial bitter taste. Yeah, that strong zest type of taste. Now we now we actually skin that and put that in certain dishes to enhance the flavor when we cook. Yeah. But uh, from the from the raw taste, it's very bitter, and uh, nobody would want to eat that. I mean, you can't eat an orange. You would eat an orange. Like, yeah, yeah. Right? So that's why that's there. Um. So and that's why I don't think it would work for an orange. Now, conversely, an apple, right. very different. Yeah. You bite into it, you don't taste anything bitter in it at all. Right. right? Maybe sour, but not bitter. And those grow in the area. So. Right. <laughs> right. Big difference. Watermelon. Interesting. Corn. Corn's another one. You go to the Four Corners area. There was a lot of uh, Dene that would uh, uh, talk about seeing the Bigfoot in their cornfields, and they would just be grabbing corn and eating it. And you can do that. If you shuck a piece of corn, you can eat it uncooked. It doesn't matter. And it's just as sweet and juicy as you would pulling it out of a cook pot. I don't know if people realize that or not, but you can take corn right off the cob and just pull it up and eat it. Done it. Yeah. Um, oh, that's and, a good and, idea, Henry. Open the orange up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did that. I, I did that. I had one. I, well, I didn't open it up. Stuck it down on the top of a small brush. And this was like uh, at the, the old place where I was doing the 24 hour, you know, recording project and Ooh, we want the recipe we want the recipe <laughs> yeah, um but yeah but you know, you, you know what though even when you cut an orange 
Mm. That smell of the skin is so overpowering. Uh huh. Yeah. That it it's could a strong citrus. Mm. It could be a deterrent rather than an attractant. You know. So I don't know. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't if you cut them open. Not sure. Don't leave them a grapefruit though. They'll get thrown back at you. Oh yeah, <laughs> right at your head. <laughs> oh man. But so have you gotten? Uh, it's very interesting. You talked earlier about. Uh, the gentleman seeing the Bigfoot like scooping and uh, putting its hands in the water almost as if to fish. Very similar encounter happened in Vermont oh. in 2009, a year before that trail cam picture was taken. Okay. Uh, about a tenth of a mile away, not too far. And a gentleman was driving uh, down the particular road. I know the exact location of it. And there in the pond off to the side, he saw one of these things. I'll be right like, next putting its hands in the water, um, you know, scooping up almost. He wasn't sure if it was drinking or eating the weeds or whatever. And that was what he, this gentleman seen. He thought it was a gorilla, you know, from his description, the best he could describe. He was unfamiliar with Bigfoot or anything like that. So he goes, you know, he actually asked, the, you know, his neighbor, hey, did, did we lose a gorilla here or something? And the gorilla escaped from a zoo or a circus or something? Because I'm driving home and I see one saying, you know, so that was a very interesting story. <clears throat> Doesn't um, this is a random thought? But does doesn't New York have the story of the um, the oh, what they uh, they were vacationing from a different country and they were like, you guys have uh, monkeys in your? We saw monkeys fishing or. I, I heard that one too. Okay. I, I was like, was I can't from, remember uh, if this is a thing or not. I believe it was a Lake George story. Okay. It was around Lake George. I believe the, the it was, I'm pretty sure they were Japanese. Yes. Yes. You got and it. And yep. they were visiting the Lake George area and they were on a boat and they had seen um, one of the little islands that inhabit that dot Lake Georgia. They're not inhabited islands, but they saw what they, you know, saw was a couple of them doing something in the water, or like they were fishing or, or doing something, and they, they heard some chatter. So um, he's back. He's back. The one, the only Chris Bennett. Yes, I got yes. I got a question for Chris real quick, if that's all right. <laughs> Chris, you're from Kentucky, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How crazy is uh, the eastern side of the state for Bigfoot? Is it pretty wild? Well, yeah, there's, uh, you know, it's so far away. I, I don't hardly get oh, over okay. there because okay. uh, I have been to the, I have been to the eastern but, part of Kentucky. Yes. Because Daniel yes. Boone is out over there, right? Yep. Daniel Boone National Daniel Forest. Daniel Boone National Forest, yes, yep. sir. And okay. Well, the first time uh, Scott, uh, one of our, our members, uh, Scott Smith, had went there years ago. The first trip he made, he found a track, and okay. he tried to cast it, but it was on a hillside. And so, what he he told me what he ended up getting was a, looked like he casted a snake. <laughs> his his uh his casting stuff ran out of the back of the hill. Which uh, you know, it was on the incline. What could you do? You can't. You couldn't do anything. But he couldn't find any other tracks, you know, that are on the level. To, to cast. But very first trip over there, he found he found a trackway. Sure enough. Okay. Gotcha. So I believe there's something going on over there. And, and, there and Alex, I was paraphrasing, so I could not. I may not necessarily be a hundred percent correct on all of the facts. I believe they were on a boat. Actually, I, I had a witness that was on a boat in Lake, on Lake George that had a witness and saw one on the shoreline um, moving about. And the funny thing is, is when I talked to him, I knew his name because he was a, uh, a, a co-worker or a co, um, there was a, a, and this is, this is what's really, you want to hear how, how this is too coincidental to be a coincidence. Right is that there was a Lake George, New York uh, documentary called The Last Rado 
Now, what a rado is, is basically a floating gunship. And at the southern end of Lake George is Fort William Henry. Of course, that's the same Fort William Henry that is of the last of the Mohegans. Family. Yep. Um, cool. Now, that what they had done in John, and so we ended up working with this guy by the name of John, who was a diver, John Weitzel. And um, John was diving and actually taking pic photographs and actually doing 3D reconstructions graphically of this rado. And he has also done a lot of other work for like the Navy. Um, he did one of the space station, a graphic representation of the space station, which is in the Smithsonian Institution. Um, and unfortunately, John passed away. Um, going on about eight years ago, seven, eight years ago, um, died very young. He was like 43 years old, 44 years old. Um, but John had had the sighting, uh, up that brought me to my research area one, him and his wife went off trail and they had that escort whole ordeal. I've told that story before I get a, a, a few years ago, I get a story from a guy and his name looked familiar and I start talking with him. I get him on the phone. We start talking and it was the actual director and producer of the lost red O. Wow. And he had a Bigfoot sighting. Oh man. Um, on the same side of Lake George that John and his wife had their encounter. And the funny thing is, is I go, so, you know, John White. So he's like, yeah, how do you know, John? So, well, John had a Bigfoot sighting back in 2000. He's like, he did? He never knew about it because John never talked to him about it. He was anonymous up until the day he died. Oh, man. So even this guy never knew, but here they both have had a Bigfoot sighting in the same general area of Lake George from different perspectives. And they worked together in this really serious documentary and did not know about it. That is so wild, man. Wow. And as an investigator, there's something going on. And those are one of those aha moments when you're like, there was another similar coincidence that years ago, there's a soccer camp butted up to the mountain range that's near my research area one, not quite near probably about a good seven, eight miles somewhere on that, but still it butts up to the back end of the mountain range. And there's a soccer camp there. Well, there was a sheriff's department dispatch that everybody heard, uh, except me apparently, but I got, I got phone calls about it. But apparently there was a Bigfoot spotted at the soccer camp. So I guess the sheriff's department responded. They didn't see nothing. And they had suggested, well, maybe it was somebody just goofing off in a costume and off they went. So many years later, <clears throat> I bump into this guy who who does like this little outdoor adventure type of channel. He was on public. He was actually on PBS for a while mm -hmm. locally. Um, the guy, uh, the gentleman is a retired police officer. And I had known him from the time I was a paramedic uh, at, at years ago, back in the early 90s. And... We bumped the, into each other taking the private investigation exam. And we start talking. He goes, I'm, he goes, wait, 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 wait. You know, we were laughing because, oh, geez, yeah, you know, you remember me that day I was, you know, I was up in your squad room because the, the house next to the ambulance garage was a crack house. And oh, one geez. day I, I come in as a supervisor and the lights are all off in the crew room and there's a friggin' SWAT team with all their, paraphernalia on mm. you know arms at the ready and everything ready to go <laughs> and and, 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 the, and this former police officer was the head of the sergeant of the SWAT team so he's like shh we're the good guys I'm like hey what's going on and he was telling me <laughs> that's funny right so we bump into each other he goes I didn't realize you were the squad detective and apparently he had interviewed Paul Bartholomew and Cliff Sparks and everybody doing an episode about Whitehall Bigfoot so that really got his interest going so I get sitting down with him and he goes, he goes, I got to tell you something. Uh, you know, what really sparked my interest in this Bigfoot thing actually was even before I became a cop 
when it, when I was 18, I was up in uh, the Fort Ann area at this soccer camp. Mm. And I heard these tremendous, and I knew every sound in that forest. And then one day something is screaming at the top. It's like, coming from the mountains. Wow. And, I, and he goes, you know, I, I started reading up and they said, well, that, that could be a Bigfoot. And he goes, that always stuck with me, but I heard something really tremendous roaring there one night as doing my rounds. It was the same freaking soccer camp 20 years earlier, 25 years earlier. That's when so things start to click. Yeah. I mean, you look at these coincidences and it's just right. unreal. Right. Um, you know, it's it's just too much coincidence to be coincidence. <laughs> so, oh, no, um, me. <laughs> he might, Mick, but not me. White Hall's pretty good drive for me. No, no, no. Speedos. I, you know, people are afraid of the dark. I don't want to be, I don't want them to be afraid of the light too. So. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Whitehall, Whitehall is an event I've always wanted to go to, but it's just, Hmm. I'm on the festival committee for Van Meter, but someday maybe I'll get out to Whitehall because that just sounds like a really good time. And as always, as Alex will tell you, if you show up in Whitehall, you get the complimentary trip with me into my research area one. (sighs) I mean, that is that's I would where like it's to, at. I would like to make the trip to Whitehall, but I might have to find me a, a RV that doesn't cost five hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> I remember the First, last you know, the last time we were up there. This is what happened. Yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah, you saw that episode, right, Jeremiah? Oh, it it was one of the. I'd say it's in my top five things that I've watched in the last year. Like that is a solid, solid episode with that audio you guys captured. That was unreal. <laughs> that was really unreal. Um, you know, and, and, you know, true to my form when I re- when I, you know, I finally realized that, Hey, that first whip wasn't them. I, again, I start historically laughing going, yeah. Cause that's to me, a lot of time now it's about, the experience, mm-hmm. you know, get out there and, and, you know, yeah, I want to get evidence, but man, just having that type of experience, like, and to get it on audio like that, I mean, that was, and uh, that's some of the cleanest audio. Of course, it wasn't done with any of the field recorders. It was actually done with recording equipment. So you can imagine, I mean, that was recording equipment with a boom mic, basically, mm-hmm over listening, you know, Alex and the gaggle that was with him talking. Yeah. So you can imagine how loud that really was. Oh yeah. I mean, you, you get, but that was loud. And that's why I thought that was them doing too. And then no, no, we, we were answering it. What? Well, so, speak, yeah. speaking of audio, Daniel Weeks has got a, a question for you, I guess, Steve, I'm at the 11th hour to document the December walkthrough. Recommendations on audio recorders don't need to be waterproof. Need several days capability, distance 200 yards max, and build power source. Uh, the Zoom H2N. The Zoom H2N. Okay. Uh, I would think that's a really solid recorder. I don't know if you're going to be able to get 24. Well, you may get 24 hours out of it. That's what I was going to ask. How much the because I have a task cam, like a basic task cam that Chris Spencer said I should get, but it it wouldn't last a, a day. So you have to yeah, zoom I, I has mean, more I, power. Yeah, I, I just put a couple of double A's and then put some good lithium ions in those babies and should go for a good twenty four hours. Yeah, um, or if not more, because um, I don't know how many times I've used. Truthfully. I've used my Zoom for, you know, four hours here, six hours there, eight hours there, four hours there, six hours. And like, and, and then after like literally a year later, I'm like, oh, the friggin' batteries are dying. So, nice. yeah, really, uh, you know, Zoom H2N. Yep. Oh, if you can build your own and, and Al- source, Alex has cool. the Zoom H1N. A lot mm-hmm. more complicated to use, I think, but a lot bigger as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the H2N... Yeah, is about the size of a box and uh, I don't have mine handy. So, mm. 
Yeah, if you if you can build build your own power source, uh, if it runs off uh, three volts, like two one point five volt batteries running series, so that means it'd be running off three volts actually. You can uh, wire up some eighteen six fifties. Usually, what I found is something that runs on three volts or designed to run on three volts will now, run on three point seven. Okay. My suggestion is with the Zoom H two N or even the Zoom H one, make sure your gain is turned all the way up. Uh, if you can get a windscreen for it, get a windscreen for it. Oh, there's Patrick. <laughs> uh, it sounds like a good time. <laughs> yeah, Patrick was watching the live podcast that we had done back in uh, 2021, uh, September of 2021, episode 72, I believe. Uh, where you and, you and Mike was in the woods, right? Oh, yeah, right. when Mike almost gets taken out. Yeah. Well, with the beach ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> but that, that night was the night we heard the tree knock, and that's where the rock was thrown at us. And then the following week, we played the enhanced audio of that. And, you know, you could clearly hear the rock on the audio on the live podcast, unlike the tree knock, which, you know, kind of didn't carry as well as we could hear it. And, uh, you know, pa Patrick always laughs at me that, that, you know, yeah, he goes, yeah, 1,200 pound Neanderthal throws a rock. See what does Steve do? He doesn't run. He just sits there and laughs. <laughs> Which, like I said, it's about the experience. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, when I was in my youth, I used to run after noises like that and stuff like that. I used to go bol bolstering in there, but. It never produced any results, so it was like the hell with it. Now I'm just gonna stay put. Well, <laughs> Patrick said he left his living room and hit around the corner watching. Oh man! So hey, there's Jeff over at Pine Island Research. Good to hey, see you, right. Jeff. Yeah. And he says I got two H10 and two H6 Pros. Love both models. Yeah. Uh, the in fact what. I'm actually podcasting on is actually a Zoom microphone. That's actually a Zoom podcast mic. Okay. So, and I found it extremely good and uh, affordable as well. So, yeah. And if you could power that with a USB, you could get one of those little battery uh, bank things and plug it in. You know? Yeah, you can use one of these as well. Um, Run it for but, days. But then again, I don't know what the range would be because this is made mm. for podcasting. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. nice thing about it is it doesn't pick up a lot of outside sound. Right. So it, it probably, this would not be the best thing to use in the field um, just because it's made for podcasting. And if I get way out here, you can't hear me anymore. So, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, that would be my recommendation. So, Jeremiah, why, why don't you tell us where we can find your podcast? Absolutely. Uh, the easiest way to find everything would be to go to BigfootSocietyPodcast.com, and then you can find links to where it is on the different platforms, different social media, uh, YouTube channel, all that good stuff. So uh, BigfootSocietyPodcast.com, and uh, make sure you sign up for the email list. Uh, I send out uh, some emails every week with stuff that I thought was cool for the community. I started a new thing there, but uh, yeah, that's how you keep up to date with what's going on. Very cool. And uh, when we end the show, please stay on afterwards. I want to chit chat with you for a bit more. Absolutely. Um, Cause you're in, you're in uh, central time, correct? I, I am in central time. So nine 45 PM for me. Yeah. Uh, so you and Chris are in the same time. Yay! <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> I'm, uh, uh, it's hard to do this time traveling thing between central and east yeah, every once in a while we get one of those weirdos that are a mountain time or pacific time yeah. <laughs> now nah, we love you out uh, there on the west coast oh yeah <laughs> lived on mountain time for years don't miss it as 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 the great late the late great jc johnson would say i live on indian time most of the time <laughs> Now for those and now for those who are Native Americans, they'll get a chuckle out of that one, uh, yeah. because eh. <laughs> um, and that's because uh, 
we would uh, we would go out and do stuff, and and uh, Leonard would be late by about fifteen minutes, and yeah. JC would be ah, that's okay. He's on time. It's just Indian time. Yeah. And, <laughs> nice. When he gets there, <laughs> and then and then Leonard would go, yeah, I'm on Indian time. Yeah. Oh man. You know, um, yeah, yeah, Leonard is a, is a great guy. We've had him on years ago. I I, I don't really want to pop him on too much now because he's got to be in a, he's in his 80s now. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, but Leonard, I, I have a video of him that was shot over a period of like an hour and a half of him explaining a lot about um, his time as a young. But that's a that's a t- tale for another day, I suppose. But uh uh, it just it is, his name popped into my head. A very fond remembrance of uh, Leonard um, and JC, of course, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know uh, uh, that that's you know there's so many researchers we miss and uh, stuff yeah. like that. Like Joe, God, I still miss uh, Joe. Yeah. That, that is still a fresh wound for us. And I was going through my my catalog today of videos. Uh, that are saved onto the StreamYard side because you only get a certain allotment of of shows. So I keep some of the best on there. That way I can download them and cut them up if I want to. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was one V blog I did. I was going to get rid of it, and then I saw that was the night you couldn't make it, Chris, and Joe co-hosted the, the, mm-hmm. the V blog. So they no, nope, I'm saving that. That's yeah. that's yeah. not going anywhere. And that tragically, you know, you know, four and a half months later he was gone. You know, mm-hmm. it's like. Uh, um, so that was a little, uh, you know, every once in a while, there's something that'll, that'll like make you stop, you know, in the middle of nowhere during the day. Uh, and that was one of them, but whew. all right. Um, well, thanks for having me on guys. Oh, this no, has no. Been a great time. Yeah. Now, uh, what do you have upcoming? I mean, planned upcoming yet? Well, uh, the one, uh, one place I'm going to that I plan to go to for 2024 is I'll be at Monster Fest 2 in beautiful Canton, Ohio. Seth is flying me out there again. So I'll be doing the podcast live out there for Small Town Monsters Monster Fest. Uh, and then I'll be at the Van Meter Visitor Festivals because I have a booth there and I kind of help run it. Um, I have, uh, let's see, an interview coming out tomorrow with uh, Mike Famelot from... Uh, Shadow of Big Red Eye from New Jersey. He's a researcher out there. And um, the interesting interview coming out on Friday about a gentleman in Wisconsin that had some really interesting things happen at a place called Beans Eddy in, I believe, central Wisconsin. So uh, always I re- release episodes on Monday and Fridays. So always uh, some fun things coming out. That is awesome. Yeah, that's yeah, that's true, Jeff. It just feels like we since show it's like losing part of the rudder, and some of this community still is mm. still sailing in circles. Yeah, it does feel that way sometimes. You're like trying to find your way after uh, after that that kind of loss. He was one of our gaggle of podcasters that was yeah. always hanging about and. Um, I wish there was some way we could have saved those after show, uh, you know, clips because, uh, man, that was so hilarious sometimes. I mean, would we get off here and my face would be hurting at life so much? Joe was, <laughs> Joe was just a, a comedian. I mean, you know, he, he gets you going, uh, and pop, he could pop something off like, you know, you would say something and he would come back with something Real like quick, that. Guys, man. Yeah, take it in a different direction. It's hilarious. And, you know, I, I saw Joe uh, just a couple of days before he passed. And uh, even then, yeah, he had that quick wit. Yeah. yeah. He sung yeah. me pretty good because yeah. I, I, you know, Molly was yelling at about him dropping a cigarette, yeah. you know, when he smoked a cigarette. And all of a sudden I dropped mine. He's like, hey, I'm on morphine. What's your excuse? Yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Just bang, just like that. Um, And I was like, I'm tired, Joe. I worked last night. Um, And I did, too. I had worked. 
uh, Saturday night and I was off Sunday and that's why we didn't do a show is because I, I actually, you know, you know, the wife grabbed me and said, we're going up to see him. And we went to see him and uh, we didn't do a show that night because I was just, I had to get to bed. And then Tuesday morning or Tuesday night, we finally passed. So, yeah, yeah, life, life can be uh, throw you some some punches sometimes. Absolutely. But we all but we all do this in, in his honor and in his name. And we will carry on with the mission because that's what he would have wanted. Mm -hmm. So and. um Um, all right, so I guess we'll get our goodbyes out tonight. But uh, thanks, Jeremiah, for coming on. It's been a blast. Stick around because like, I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions, maybe. Yeah, actually, absolutely. And I always appreciate watching uh, uh, Squatch DTV. I'm a member, I'm, I love it. You guys rock, so I, I appreciate you having me on. It's been a great night, guys. Oh, always, and you're always welcome on. You got something big sure. breaking, anything like that? Come on, just let me know, and we'll get you right on. Especially Absolutely. if like you got a big show coming on, you want to come on for five minutes, ten minutes, talk about it. You can do that yeah. too. Cool. Anytime. Cool. You're here for Thank we're you. here for you. Always an honor to have you. As well as any of our <laughs> other podcasting partners out there, yeah. like Jeff and Nikki sure. and and Brent. You guys have something big coming up. You want to come on and, and you know yeah. announce it or get the word out. Come on over here on the podcast. We'll get you on and talk about it. So um, always welcome. So uh yeah. so Chris, why don't you do your thing, brother? <laughs> Well, again, I want to thank Jeremiah for being on here with us. Uh, thank been you. an honor. All, all the honors on this end, brother. I'm telling you, we we appreciate it having you here. And uh, I want to thank everybody in chat, uh, all our listeners. Uh, we love you guys. Uh, you're the greatest audience on any Bigfoot program. The, you know, got to be, got to be. Mm. Uh, if it's the first time you're, you're listening or first time you're watching the video here on YouTube, make sure you hit that like and subscribe. Share. As Steve always says, sharing is caring. That's right. And folks, on behalf of everybody here, before we go, what do we always do? Now comes the part where we throw our heads back and laugh. Ready? Ready! <laughs> okay, folks, on behalf of everybody here, we want to wish everybody a great, happy, safe week. God bless. And of course, of course. Keep on squatching, folks. We'll catch you here next Sunday night, 9 p.m. Eastern on Squatch D TV. YouTube.com forward slash at Squatch D TV. Hey, folks, you've been watching Squatch D TV. Join us each week, Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for the latest on the Bigfoot mystery. As always, we thank you for being our loyal viewers and encourage all to subscribe to our YouTube page at youtube.com slash Steve Culls. As always, have a great week. Stay safe. God bless. And keep on squatching.